Good morning. How y'all doing this morning? It's always helpful when the preacher looks at the order of service. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. So I finally did and realized I didn't have the music to learn the song. So, so that's good. good. It's good to be here. Glad that you're here as well. Would you pray as we open our service today? Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. And we, um, oh, we just stand amazed in the presence of Jesus, the Nazarene, and we're grateful today that we can call you our King. We pray that as we worship today that you would find our worship pleasing. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right.
by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Do we come forward for all for the please? Pray, please. Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us. We pray that as we give, we do so cheerfully. As we remember that we have an opportunity to help in the assistance of uh, providing for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
will swing one way or the other. But that is just shocking to me. That we live in such a time of doctrinal ignorance, doctrinal indifference. It is, it is weakening the church. I guarantee you the reason that our churches are so weak is because we don't believe that we serve a sovereign king in the universe. Amen? I don't, I don't, I don't think the average church member understands that. And it is frightening to me that that's the case. If, if only there was a book that clearly taught who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what he will do. If only there was a book that taught that clearly. Oh, wait. There is one. Well, why in heaven's name? Why in heaven's name are we teaching something other than the word of God to people today? I'm frightened. I, I am frightened at the belief about Jesus. I, I mean, I've heard it. I've had people tell me, you do understand that when you teach on doctrine, that doctrine divides people. It should. It should divide truth from error. We need to understand that we're standing on the shoulders of people who have fought this battle about the deity of Jesus for two thousand years. If the devil, if the enemy can create doubt in the person of Christ, he has won, folks. Because if he is not God, if he is not equal with the Father, if he is not equal with the Spirit, then, well, for one thing, there is no Spirit and there is no Christ when we start talking like that. One of the reasons that I wanted to go through this gospel was to examine the person of Christ through the lens of John, the apostle. John knew that Matthew and Mark and Luke each would look at Jesus in a different way, not in, 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 in an inaccurate way, but, but John had a laser focus on the deity of Jesus Christ. Now we've already seen We've already seen John's declaration of this truth, showing Jesus as Lord over creation, as Lord over disease. We see John in our passage today and last Sunday as Lord over the Sabbath. And the Jewish leaders were blind to that paralyzed man, were they not? They were completely blind to the fact that Jesus Christ healed that guy. They were angry that he had healed that man on the Sabbath. And you recall that, that they had devised multiple Sabbath rules, 39 of them, defining work on the Sabbath. And that Jesus had violated one or more of those. G the Jews, because of this violation, began to find ways that they would kill. If there was any doubt as to what Jesus was stating before, our passage today very clearly reveals who Jesus is and why these Jewish leaders wanted him dead. You hear people, I, I mean, I read it a lot, I recognize that maybe you don't read theology all the way like I do. I get that. I get that. I'm a nerd. I, I, I'm a nerd when it comes to theology and Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff. And and that's how God created me. <clears throat> there are times I wish he created me with a little bit more of a bent toward mechanical things. But he has not done that yet. And I'm 65. I don't know that that's changing. I just, you know, I am who I am kind of thing. But I can tell you this. I can tell you this. That as I have read more and more theology, the more that I understand that if we miss the person of Christ, we miss God. And my role as your pastor is not just to pat you on the back and tell you that society is fine and everybody that, that worships is doing okay because they are not. You, you, 
you understand that there'll come a day that I've got to answer to God Himself about what you know about the gospel and about the person of Jesus Christ. He will look at me and hold me accountable for what you have learned. And I don't take that lightly, as you know. I don't. <coughs> so, as we, as we look at this passage today, we're going to actually look at the passage, passage but we're going to weave into it the person of Christ. And I try for it not to be a lecture. I really will. But you are going to get some things here that you might have to... You know, I, was, I was in the seminary uh, many years ago, as you know, and we were sitting in a class with a, with a, a gentleman who had uh, studied over at Spurgeon's College in England and has got, had gotten his doctorate, and he, and he spoke with an English accent. He never raised his voice. He never raised his voice. It was just... It was just very even keel the whole time, whole time. And so he happened to be teaching on some contemporary theology, which, um, you know, at that time I hadn't been reading that much and I was just having trouble even following him. And so Dr. Barnard was his name. Dr. Barnard was, was going through the text and he was looking up and he was engaging the class and then he looked back down. And eventually one of the students said, Dr. Barnard, this is all just over my head. I, I, and he said, this is this idea. He went, can I suggest that perhaps you stand in your chair? Didn't <laughs> 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 I can remember that like it was yesterday. I mean, really did. Now, I, there may be a couple of things that you may need to stand in your feet today. But here's what I have found. I have found as a student, if I'm not challenged, and Amy, you tell me if you agree with this, as a teacher, professional teacher, and are there other professional teachers in here? I just don't miss anybody. But if you only tell kids what they already know, and you don't raise the bar a little bit, the average person will never know how to engage in information that's a little bit over their heads. So if you want me to dumb everything down to the point where nobody has to think about anything, I can't do that. I, I, just, I just can't. Well, I could, but I refuse. I'm just not going to do that. And it's not like today we're going to be in seminary. Thing, but there are some things in here I want to challenge us with today. So, in looking at verses 17 through 47 in our, in our fifth chapter, there are many people who think that Jesus, that, that John has taken, that Jesus is standing before the Sanhedrin, and they have been, the Sanhedrin were 70 Jewish scholars who were gathered to, to basically rule on the religious things that were happening in the Jewish nation. And so the thought is that perhaps Jesus was standing in front of them and they were questioning him and he was responding. I don't know that that's true. But it is interesting there that the word answered that he uses in our passage today is typically used in a courtroom setting. So I know that snores there a little bit. It really is. Uh, that it could be. So as this is happening here, as it's happening, these Jewish leaders we know are already trying to, to, to basically trick Jesus into ways that they would have him be able to say that he needed to die. Trying to build this case. They, they were sure that he had already committed these violations that were worthy of death because of the Sabbath violation, even giving the formerly paralyzed man the permission to do what? Well, not just walk. Because he could have walked and not been working. But to pick up his bed, that's right. And they said, okay, pick up your bed and go. That was work to those Jewish people. Now, that was not a violation of the fourth commandment, in my opinion. And I don't, I don't, I don't think it was because the guy wasn't working. He couldn't carry a bed for his labor. So it was work. But they, they, they saw it as, as a reason to not like 
Jesus, and this infuriated his leaders. But what he winds up saying as we look in the rest of this text sends them absolutely over the edge. Because in this passage, Jesus absolutely declares that he is God. He absolutely declares that. If you hear anybody say that, that, that you know, people, people, and I have heard them, and I read many this week, that said, Jesus never claimed to be God. I had somebody yesterday at the funeral sort of imply that to me in a conversation. It was all I could do not to jump out of my skin. <laughs> but I didn't. I had another person that, that, that talked to me about the way they per, perceived the way to heaven. And I felt like getting out my guitar and playing Stairway to Heaven for me. Because that's exactly <laughs> what they were implying. And I, I resisted that urge as well. So, now in looking at the outline today, I sort of adapted John MacArthur's outline on this passage. It's not exactly his, but the idea came from him. So, let me just be clear about that. So, the first thing that I want to look at is this idea of equality in being in being. Jesus begins his defense statement with a brilliant response. He says, my father and I have, my father has been working until now and I have been working. It is a very simple statement that Jesus uses to remind these authorities that the Sabbath rest was built into creation because God created it in six days and he rested on that seventh day. So naturally, humans, human beings, will work those six days and rest on the seventh. But what these Jewish theologians, for some reason, didn't understand this, and they, didn't, they, they seemingly didn't know it, that while God might have rested on the seventh day, he did not stop being active. This sort of reminds me of what the group of people called deists believe. And you've heard of them. Some of our family fathers were deists. I mean, they were. We don't like to admit that, but they were. A deist, um, in their view, believes that God formed the universe, established the laws of the universe, and then sort of wound up the machine and then just had let it go. Sort of like the the watchmaker analogy. R.C. Sproul writes about that in one of his books. God wound the clock and steps back from everything and just lets it run. Folks, that's not what Scripture teaches. You can't look at, at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and come away with that and say that God was like the watchmaker. Very easily you can refute that with the simple Hebrew word bara. In the beginning, God bara, God created there. The word create in, in Hebrew in Genesis 1 implies a sustained action, that God is forever doing that. It, in, it implies that when he created the universe, he continues even to this second to sustain. You might say, well, this, does he really have to do that? You do understand that, that physicists don't completely understand the atom. They don't completely understand it. And if for a moment God let go of the laws that are surrounding creation and surrounding physics, that this universe would implode in a split second and would not exist. You can see that in Colossians 1, where it talks about Jesus being the creator, being in the image of God as well. You take time to look at that, Colossians 1, 15, 17. And if God were to quit working, if he were to stop upholding the universe, he would employ it. We've even been told by evolutionists, you can, you can see how that sort of works. You can see that evolutionists who tell us that nature operates under, under its own steam, that, that again, God may have started it, but we really don't need him now. Can I tell you that that theory has sort of entered into our churches? 
Because if you believe that God is some benign being that is not involved in what is going on in the lives of his people, you believe that God is more of a deist than he is sovereign over the universe. You understand that, right? <clears throat> if, if God is removed and he's just in heaven and when something bad happens, he goes, whoops. Or maybe he was taking a nap or he was on a trip when something like that happens. You understand, that is the only other view that you can have. I believe in a God who is sovereign, who is working out everything for the good of his people and his own glory. Amen. Do I understand? Are you kidding me? I don't understand everything about it. <laughs> but I've got to trust and hope that he knows what he is doing and that I trust him. If I trust him for eternity, and I trust him for the tragedy that happened here at this church on October the 8th. Yes. Do I understand it? No. <laughs> but he is a good God. Where is God when it's prevalent in many circles? Because they don't want to see God as sovereign. And as the king, but they have a God who is too weak to operate. He's too weak to act. And for a God who is too weak to act and too weak to operate, that means he does not love us. He does love us. When Jesus says, my father has been working until now and I have been working, he was saying this idea of God making the watch, winding the watch, and then withdrawing is a false understanding of God. So, the, so these Jewish rabbis even had a theory about God's work. They actually debated whether or not God violated his own Sabbath. Is that not the stupidest thing you've ever heard? They actually, there's data, there's, there's data showing that. Is it acceptable for God to work on the Sabbath, they ask? Ultimately, they graciously exempted God from the 49th of their laws, since he owned everything, and he could not be accused of moving one thing from one place to another, because he owned everything. That's ridiculous. But the rabbis were not ready for what Jesus said. So, so my father works even on the Sabbath day. So do I. Since it is permissible for him to do it. And since God is my father, therefore I'm allowed to do it. If you argue with what I'm doing on the Sabbath, you're arguing with God, Jesus said. He was claiming to be God right here. You might say, why, why are you so passionate about this? Because if he was not God, we are still dead in our sins. He was just a good guy who did a good thing, and we can follow his example. But if that's, if that's the case, then I've got to do something else. Then I've got to be on this stairway to heaven of trying to get better and better and better, and maybe at some point God will accept me. If I work hard enough, if I get baptized enough, if I pray enough, if I read the Bible enough. My question is, what is enough? In that environment, you never know. So when we, when we look at this idea of Jesus being God, now this is where you might have to sit up a little straighter, you might have to stand on your pew for just, just a moment. There are, two, there are two concepts when we talk about the Trinity today that we need to understand at its basic core. There's this idea of the ontological, and that, that's just a long word that just means being. That's all that that means. And this is the understanding that the Godhead is three in one, or the very being of God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, who together are one being, 
and their structure is unity. The second understanding of the Trinity is more economic. And that's the understanding that the Trinity has roles within the, within the Trinity. So you've got the Father sending the Son into the world for our redemption. The Son acquires our redemption. The Spirit applies that <coughs> redemption to us. We don't have three gods. We have one God in three persons distinguished by what they do. Now that's about as, as simple an explanation of the Trinity as, as, as I can offer. But I think it's a good one there for us. And we begin to talk about John's gospel, it gives us the picture that Jesus is equal to the Father in power, in glory, in being. You can see that in John 1, 1 through 18. You remember, I spent what seemed like years in those 18 verses. It may seem like years to you, but I could have gone on and on and on and never even finished in those verses. The, John 1.1 1, 1 informs us that the Father and the Son are different and one. In one sense, they are identical. In, in another, they are distinguished. And when Jesus said to these <coughs> Jewish believers, he said, these Jewish leaders, I don't do anything on my own. I do what the Father tells me to do. I do what the Father sent me to do. I watch the Father and I do what the Father So we see equality in being, but look at equality in work. When, when I was thinking about this week, I was thinking about this particular phrase here about the Father working and Jesus working. One author commented, he just had a sentence in there about Jesus being the carpenter's son. That made me think about a very young Jesus working with his earthly dad. Joseph in his carpenter shop. You, know, you, you can imagine Joseph teaching Jesus all about carpentry at that time. And him just paying attention and learning to do what his dad did in that regard. But now we can see this Christ working in a much larger workshop. Folks, I believe the hand of Jesus is in every one of his people's lives at all times. Amen. At all times. Now, that gives me hope that there's meaning in what's happening. I don't always understand when you see this passage of Scripture, you see Jesus healing that, that paralytic there in the passage. It's merely just a snapshot of his work. He is obeying the message that the Father gave him to do. It's no surprise that John adds commentary that the Jews sought even more to kill him because he made himself equal with when, and then when Jesus said, he used a very simple word that enraged them. You ready for it? My. That was it. No Jew would say, my. That was too personal. They would say, our Father. But when Jesus said, my Father, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm, y'all know I'm sort of obsessed with uh, City Light and their music. I just, I just, their music is so good. And in the song, only a holy God 
there's a line in there that says only a holy God, and then it repeats, but it says only my holy God. And I, I watched a, a, a clip of why they changed that, because they, they felt like it was important that there was that personal sense of understanding that God is my God. But that one word, my, is what sent them over the edge, and the Jews completely understood at that point what Jesus was saying. They knew that when Jesus commented, the Father is working even on the Sabbath, and I am working on the Sabbath, he was equating himself with God. They were sure that he had broken the Sabbath, is the word used there. He was loosing the Sabbath to the point that he had dissolved it. Now they're adding blasphemy to the charge as well. The third thing, that, that Jesus has equality and sovereignty in verse 21. In verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. This is a reproduction of the Father's work as well. This comment probably startled the people listening because Jesus is stating that he was able to raise the dead and give life and will. Why would this be startling? Because in all of the Old Testament literature, in rabbinical writings as well, there was only one being that could give life, and that was God. And when Jesus said he could give life at well, he was proclaiming, I am God. Anybody tells you Jesus never claimed to be God, you need to look at them. Don't jump out of your skin like I almost did. But you need to look at them and say, can I take you to the Gospel of John in the fifth chapter? Folks, what else is Jesus saying then that he's God? You, you can even go to the literature like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Pseudepigrapha. It's revealed that the raising of the dead, the giving of life, were solely the prerogatives of God alone. So they didn't even think, the Jews didn't even think the Messiah could do that when he would come. So when Jesus claimed this power, he was claiming to be God. Did you know that the last miracle that John records is the raising of Lazarus from the dead? Why do you think he did that? John is screaming to the world, Jesus is God. Jesus also adds this phrase, gives life to whom he will, further revealing his sovereign will, even in salvation. Why is it that I can preach to a hundred people and maybe one person come to Christ. Is it because I'm a terrible preacher? That may be the case. But it's more likely that God sovereignly calls whom he wants to call to salvation. You say, well, thank God, we're not saying that God didn't choose us. He, yeah. he does. But I can tell you this. If anybody wants to be a believer, you know what? They can. They can. It's that simple. Somebody approached uh, C.H. Spurgeon one time because they heard him pray something. And, uh, somebody said, well, Spurgeon, you, you actually believe in election? And he said, yeah, my prayer is that God saved the elect and then elect some more. And that's you know, somebody wants to come to faith in Jesus, he will in no way turn them away. Equality and judgment is the fourth thing. Another claim to deity is the fact that the Father has given him as the judge overall. And in the Old Testament, judgment is alone given to Jehovah God. And the rabbinic writings reveal that as well. Some concluded that, that God doesn't judge anybody, but that is not correct. The simple truth is that the Father has given the prerogative to judge to Jesus, the Son. 
And then let's look at the fifth one. I'm running out of time. Equality in honor. The last proof or evidence of the deity of Christ is found there in verse 23. Our culture tells people they can believe in anything. We all worship the same God. We can come to him in whatever way we choose, even claiming we can reject Jesus but still has the Father. The Pope actually... <coughs> oh, wow, wow, sorry. <coughs> the Pope has actually said that there is a place in heaven for people who reject Jesus but who are good people. Seriously, I've read the quote from him. I have read the quote from him. I, I, I don't even know what to do with that except to tell you <clears throat> anybody who would believe that is not a believer. And they have been deluded. <clears throat> Am I saying the Pope is deluded? My baby is that. And I don't particularly care to say that publicly, but I don't have any fear of saying that. <clears throat> Some suppose that Jesus was a mere ambassador of the Father. And this might seem plausible, but it's really not accurate. Can, tell me this. When an envoy of a president goes overseas, is that envoy treated in the same way that the president? There's not even, it's not even close to that. They may honor them, you know, and, and if an envoy is armed, I mean, it, it falls back on the country to do something about that. <clears throat> now, our current situation is, I don't know that we would do anything if an envoy was armed. Um, should have said that's too political. We'll leave that alone. <clears throat> um, we all know that Jesus even told a parable about the workers in the vineyard. Remember that? They didn't treat the owner's messenger with honor. And then what did they do to the son of the owner of the vineyard? They killed him. That's right. And there are preachers today who seem to give a pass to people who appear religious or sincere, but who nonetheless have never followed Jesus Christ. And I tell you, the Father will not receive anyone who has not been to the Son for salvation. John tells us. What does John tell us in John 14, 6? Jesus said, I even, I am a way, a truth, a life. Not what he says. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and Nobody can get to the Father of the way. That's not what he says. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Imagine these Jewish leaders speaking to Jesus as they did. Jesus was on trial. Now, whether he was standing in a courtroom at, right at this point or not, I can't say definitively. We know eventually he does. But what Jesus essentially says to them is this. You, you do understand and you're talking with the judge of the universe. You, you do understand you're talking to the Lord of the Sabbath. You do understand you're talking to the one before whom you'll stand in judgment the one whom the Father has given the power of life and himself. And if you don't honor me, you cannot honor the Father. I cannot imagine the Jewish leaders doing that. But as I look at the evangelical church in the United States, all of a sudden I understand how that happened, folks. Because my fear, as I've said to you for years, is that our churches are filled with people that don't know who Jesus really is. I'm here today to proclaim to you that he is the king of the universe. Amen. That he is the savior of mankind. That he is the Lord God over all. And that you'll not get to heaven except through him. And to get to heaven
gladly through him. You've got to repent of your sins and confess him as Lord. And your life has got to begin to reflect him as your king. Amen. When people look at us, they all see that we live in a different kingdom. And if they don't, that says something about us. It doesn't say anything about him. Jesus changed history with 11 guys. He had a 12, but that guy was right. But those 11 people changed the world. We've got more than 11 people here right now. <laughs> the only thing holding us back is us. My question for us, do we really believe that Jesus is the king of this universe? And if we do, then we've got one message. We are supposed to be going and discipling and baptizing. Leading people to Jesus and loving people as well. Let's pray today. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for the Spirit of God. Lord, we would pray that we honor you by honoring the Son honoring the Spirit. And we know that the Spirit wants the emphasis to be on Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, I pray for every one of us today that we, we are certain that we have a correct view of the Lord Jesus. That if an eternity passed, he, he gave up a prerogative and he put on flesh to live among human beings. To live amongst people who would reject him, who would abuse him, who would kill him in order to save him. Lord, we, we pray that as we see Jesus as God, and while he is a judge, and the scripture says that God is angry with the wicked every day, what the overwhelming message of the gospel is one of God's love for sinners. I'm thankful for that, for that. That includes me, that includes us, we who are here today. And we're, we're supposed to just go tell folks about him, how he has delivered us from sin, and he's put our feet on solid ground, and that there's a hope that we have because he lived and died and rose on the third day. We have that same hope. So keep that before us, please, Lord, as we just move about people that we're close to. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we're going to sing a verse of hymn number 372, Living for Jesus. If you need to come to the altar, feel free to do that. You know it's always appropriate for you to pray right where you are.
announcements and prayer requests. Um, I just want to make sure you understood. <coughs> excuse me. That next Sunday, the Operation Christmas Travel shoe boxes are due to be back here, so they can be taken and shipped where they need to go. We've got more boxes out there. There are also sheets that tell you what can and cannot be in those boxes. But that's in the bulletin, but that's next Sunday. Just want to alert you to that. Tonight, we won't have anything here, but um, there probably, if you wanted to still attend the Hearts and Hands dinner at uh, Bahia Methodist Church from 5 to 7, you'd be welcome to do that. I think we've got about 21 people that are going, but I'm sure that they would have a slot or two or, uh, if you wanted to attend that. But we'll, we're going to meet over there uh, this evening. Now, from a, any other announcements, you can look in the, you, you can read, as you say. I'll just let you read. Let the book. No, it's great because he loved it. So, you know, he really did. Uh, the one prayer request I received um, is for the Ashley Thurman family. He lived in Independence, um, but was a pastor in Lambert, Mississippi. 49 years old, died um, in the last few days, and just unexpectedly. So pray for them. Pray for that church as well. Um, you know how hard it is. I think anyone knows that from uh, just Brother Burton being here for that time and then passing and it was just traumatic. And so it was traumatic for them as well. Right. Would you stand with me? We will we will be dismissed. Hey, no Joe, so would you come and pray? Oh, yeah.